Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here once again with some more 30 Years War. That first episode wasn't confusing one bit at all, was it? Uh, at least not for me. I wasn't confused one bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am going to apologize for the first episode because... I was extremely confused and did not know, I guess, the history of the area and stuff. And a big shout out and thank you to all of you in the comments from the last video for not uh, kicking my butt. Because I also expected I was downloading that video. I was like, this video is going to get like a million dislikes. <laughs> because I was confused. I didn't understand the kind of the layout and how things kind of worked. And so, and, but you guys... There's a lot. I think there, last I checked, there was like 39. I might have been 40 comments on there. And most of them were, you know, telling me the, the Holy Roman Empire is not the same, you know, as the, uh, the Roman Empire from, you know, the beginning of whatever, you know, the one from the past, from like the one from 2000 years ago, you know, that, that kind of that died off. And this was kind of... It, it was kind of the name was kind of like brought back, but has nothing to do with the, uh, you know, the Roman Empire, the, the first one, you know. So I uh, appreciate you guys there because that kind of had me confused. And uh, thank you for, uh, so basically the Holy Roman Empire is basically like a group of nations, kind of like the the United Nations or maybe like the EU or something. Like they're all, I mean, he calls them provinces, but I get, like they all kind of have their own leader like they're all their own country kind of like europe they all you know united nations they're they're all their own like own identity they're just kind of all put into that category and i guess the leader of each one of those little province slash countries kind of they kind of, they kind of vote on uh i'm confused i'm still confused there but who like the the leader is of the Holy Roman Empire, I guess, you know, but that, that the Holy Roman Empire person, <laughs> so kind of confused, but I kind of understand it now that those little countries are not all part of one big country. Like, like the Holy Roman Empire is not just one country. It's basically filled in with a bunch of little countries that, you know, kind of have similarities. And I think the Holy Roman Empire is Catholic. And then you had a, you know, what was that country called that was rebelling that was was protestant and then you had like outside countries that were from outside the holy roman empire kind of kind of trying to help you know help them because you know everyone's fighting kind of like for their own faith you know and so you kind of have this battle you know catholic versus protestant and outsiders kind of coming in to help out you know their religion i mean a little very confusing, but I, you know, I definitely can understand it, you know, a, little, a lot more now. I was not as confused now as what I was before, and that's thanks to you guys. So, a big shout out to you guys. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you guys helping me instead of just, like, you know, going down my throat because, like, oh, my God, I'm going to get my butt ripped in the comments. And I, I felt so horrible about the last video because I want to understand this stuff. And then... And when I don't, you know, I'm like, man, these people are going to, like, think I'm an idiot, <laughs> which uh, a lot of times I am. So, you know, because I am definitely not the smartest person out there, but, you know, I do like to, you know, try to understand things. Uh, so I just want to say thank you once again. Thank you, guys. And, uh, yeah, let's get into this uh, video. Uh, kind of forget where we kind of left off. Uh white white mountain and they had that battle and like the catholics kind of pushed them off the mountain and that was like i mean they're gonna show the map here anyways i'm sure but so basically it's right now right now anyway um it's two different religions just going out you know people are in the beliefs but we all know behind that like the powers that be you know, they're, 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 there's more to it than that. People want land. People want power. And they're going to use, you know, 
religion as that. I mean, the soldiers and stuff, they're fighting for their beliefs, but they have nothing, there's nothing in it for them uh, as far as they're just kind of going for their religion and fighting for what they believe in. But the powers that be who run these countries, you know, that, you know, they have something else in mind, I'm sure, besides just, you know, oh, yeah, this is my religion. I'm fighting for this. No, that they want something else to gain from it. I'm pretty sure. Uh, maybe not, but I'm pretty sure, you know, that that's war, guys. I mean, people want something out of it, you know. Your war is not as simple as, you know, there's always more to it. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe if you're your first time here. If it's your, I mean, if you're, yeah, first time here, and if it's not, if it is your first time here, I would say you should go back and check the first episode of the series, but don't get mad. <laughs> like I said, uh, you might be confused because I was confused at any, I don't know. Because I'm not familiar with this time period at all, like, at all. So, you know, because I, I thought, oh, maybe it might be similar to, like, the Napoleon series, because anyway. It's about like a hundred and it's a hundred and like eighty year, hundred and seventy year difference between the two. So I thought maybe the the countries and I guess all that stuff would be similar, but it's really not. Except for you know you got France and all that over there to the uh, the west. But anyways, guys, I've been blabbering on long enough. I'm sure you guys want to get to the video, but you know I just like to kind of explain myself and talk to you guys. You know. You know, beforehand, you know, I just don't want to go, hey, look at my channel, play. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. But anyways, guys, uh, let's go. Like, subscribe, comment, all that fun stuff, and play. It was late 1620. The Bohemians and their allies had been ruthlessly crushed by a... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm back up. So this is called the, Dan the Danish Intervention. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly. Uh, so the, I'm, assume, I'm assuming hey, the Catholics were, are winning. I'm sure in the Danish or Danish Protestant. You know, uh, I would think so. I, I mean, I would think so, but you know, just to make it more even. But we're going to start over again. 1620. The Bohemians and their allies had been ruthlessly crushed by a Catholic army. Mm -hmm. Spanish troops were marching on the Palatinate and the Protestant Union was in disarray. The rebel defeat at the Battle of White Mountain... Okay, so it's the Protestant Union against the Holy Roman Empire. So there's like there's a union, I guess, that's like different countries. They're kind of like together. And then you have the Holy Roman Empire, which is like a group of countries that are together. You know, I mean, I guess the, the Protestant countries, they're not like under this you know, collect, I mean, they're, they're their own country. They're not under this. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm making it more complicated than it has to be. So, but anyway, it's two different groups, you know, different countries, both sides have their own beliefs and they're kind of sticking up for each other to win this kind of religious war. That That's how it's starting off anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to get everything straight in my head and get, have you guys kind of know where I'm coming from? So, yes, I think I think we're ready now. <laughs> I hope I'm ready. <laughs> it was catastrophic for their cause, but Ferdinand still had problems to deal with. Though Frederick V had been defeated and his military forces smashed, he had not renounced his claim to the Bohemian throne, leaving Ferdinand with the task of eradicating his support without provoking a general European war. Welcome to our second video on the Thirty Years' War and the Danish Intervention. All right. The sponsor of this video, Raid Shadow Legends, will take you to All the right. world of dark fantasy and guys. realism. For those who don't know, Raid Shadow Legends is a brand new free-to-play collection RPG game that is taking the mobile game daily login reward for the first 90 days in the game. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special link, and start playing. After his army's defeat at White Mountain, Frederick V first fled to Breslau and then to the Netherlands. Even though he had lost militarily, the Palatinate's ruler could still count on Protestant allies. Okay, okay Protestant allies. So like, I guess the purple, I guess purple is all the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah. Pro, 
and I'm trying to get slightly different colors, but I'm not sure. Anyways, okay. But yeah, I guess like the Netherlands, you know, there's, there's countries like, okay, okay, these okay, there's these little blue, like the little gray guys here, they're Protestants, and then you got like these kind of reddish guys here, and they're the Catholics, right? I'm just trying. I'm, I'm just trying to make it more simple on myself to kind of you know see who's what. So, anyways. Though he had lost militarily, the Palatinate's ruler could still count on Protestant allies. The defending generals Georg Friedrich of Baden and Christian of Brunswick could not coordinate their armies properly, so they were defeated piecemeal by Thiel in the battles of Wimpfel and Hoxt in May and June of 1622. Ernst von Mansfeld retreated to the Netherlands, abandoning the Palatinate, which was then gifted to Maximilian of Bavaria, along with its accompanying position as elector. In 1623, Christian, who wished to invade Bohemia and unify with Bethlen Gabor, who was once again at war with the emperor, advanced from the Netherlands with 21,000 men. He was forced into battle by Thiel and crushed at the Battle of Stadtlohn by 30,000 Catholic soldiers. Wow. After this battle, the war seemed to be concluded. However, the balance of power had been so disrupted that an external escalation of the conflict was now inevitable. Uh -oh, going north. To the north, the Kingdom of Denmark-Norway was still one of the most powerful states in Europe in 1625. The realm was not populous or traditionally wealthy in material, but had total control of the sea lanes connecting the Baltic and North Seas. Danish kings could levy taxes on this shipping, which provided a lucrative and reliable income. In the early 17th century, rulers of Denmark-Norway had several key goals. One was the pursuit of expansionist dynastic aspirations in northern Germany, and the other was the protection of the country and its Baltic hegemony from the rising power of Sweden to their eastern border. To this end, the two Scandinavian states had fought between 1563 and 1570 in the Northern Seven Years' War, and from 1611 to 1613 in the Kalmar War. The ruling dynasty of Denmark-Norway, members of the House of Oldenburg, had North German roots, and its heads considered themselves to be both kings of Denmark and German princes, as they held the Duchy of Holstein within the empire. In 1588, Christian IV ascended to the Danish throne. He used his boundless energy to make Denmark wealthy and powerful. Many of his ventures failed, but he could afford to experiment due to his massive personal fortune, being probably the wealthiest monarch in early 17th century Europe. This ambitious monarch was initially hesitant to become involved in the unfolding German conflict, but the spread of war attracted his concern. To Christian, the actions of Ferdinand II signaled that the Austrian Habsburgs were willing to trample German liberties and increase imperial authority. At the same time, the Dutch, whose truce with Spain had just ended, attempted to enmesh him into the Protestant cause. Christian IV also wished to take Bremen, Verden and Osnabrück to establish control over the great trading rivers of Elbe and Fessa. In 1624, the Dutch, English and Palatinate invited Sweden's king, Gustavus Adolphus, to help retake the Palatinate. This alarmed Christian, who feared that a large Swedish army supported by the Dutch fleet would turn the Baltic into a Swedish lake. So in January 1625, he offered to intervene. In the Danish system, the king at this time was supposed to be an equal partner with the aristocratic Privy Council or Riksgrad, and was expected to rule with their consent rather than going above them. The council did not support Christian's invasion, so he had to raise an army for himself. In Vienna, Ferdinand II wanted to lessen his reliance on Maximilian of Bavaria, who led the Catholic League army. Enter Albrecht von Wallenstein. This scion of lower nobility entered Habsburg service during the Long War with the Ottoman Empire and converted to Catholicism in order to advance his career. 
Though he was part of the Moravian army since 1615, he defected to the Emperor in 1619 and fought at the White Mountain. In the aftermath, Wallenstein assisted in the confiscation of rebel property and land transfers, emerging as a major beneficiary. Hmm. I just want to, I just want to say see like just like that some of these like you know these guys like they they want power you know they and they if they have to like switch religions or this or that you know to get what they want they'll do it you know because you know power hungry man that they, they they have dreams you know <laughs> but using a religion as a way to this one's the perfect control. gift for the friend who's been getting a little too comfortable during oh, quarantine he's, he's maybe your son a father with this new wealth he loaned ferdinand a large sum and was made a duke wallenstein was subsequently commissioned by the emperor to raise an army which would be under imperial dominion rather than that of the catholic league he did this and eventually raised a force of around 25,000. He informed the Count of Thiel that he would cooperate with him, but would not accept being the Catholic commander's subordinate. This suited Ferdinand perfectly, as the Emperor wanted to regain a personal leading role in the war. The campaign began in early 1626, during which Christian concentrated his main army of 20,000 at Wolfenbüttel so that he could keep the two armies of Wallenstein and Thiel divided. The former had occupied the cities of Magdeburg and Halberstadt due to the necessity of feeding and paying the army. It is key to note that in this period, armies employed the savage principle of bellum se ipsum alit, meaning that the armies fed and funded themselves at the expense of the local population in conquered Damn. territory. Moving from his base. I mean, just like throughout history, man, it, like all these wars, man. I mean, obviously, we concentrate, we concentrate more on Europe because there's just a lot, you know, there's a lot of history in Europe, and you know, it's it's been wrote down or whatnot. Like it's been logged. We know what what happened, you know, in Europe. But it's like there's war. Like every century, there's a bunch of wars. I man, you got to feel for the people, man. Because you know, it's like you have like family who just you just want to farm, and just constant harassment it seems like every generation has like a war coming through their land, and you know, it's like you gotta feel for they just can't catch a break, man. Like they don't care; they just want people to leave them alone so they can you know, you know, feed their families and whatnot. And man, you know, it's just gotta be rough for the families, you know. Say, go live near the coast. You might be, it might be a little easier. I don't know. The territory. Moving from his base, Wallenstein initially began operations around Goslar, but turned when he received reports that Mansfeld was advancing south along the Elbe, announcing he was coming to liberate Magdeburg. He advanced towards Dessau, where one of Wallenstein's subordinates guarded the only permanent bridge in the region, a key imperial supply route which had to be protected. On the 24th of April, 1626, the Imperial Army arrived in the region. After waiting until Mansfeld's attempts to cross the bridge had faltered, Wallenstein counterattacked and routed uh -oh. his enemy at the Battle of Dessau Bridge. Through all this, Christian IV had remained at Wolfenbüttel, attempting to gain additional German support. Meanwhile, the newly recovered Mansfeld rushed east and then south through Silesia, aiming to get to Upper Hungary and rendezvous with Gabor. Not wanting to infringe on Brandenburg's neutrality, Wallenstein initially held off from pursuing the Protestant commander. I, I just want to say this. Uh, I know I've stopped it a lot, I'm sorry, to the beginning of this video, but... Yeah, you, you kind of see that the alliance is forming. Like I say, you, you have like the Christians and the Protestants. So, you know, it, even though I'm kind of confused, like with how you kind of have the countries are kind of organized and stuff. And like, 
it's like this you got like i don't know because you i'm used to a map where everything's kind of like blocked off different countries and stuff like that but like this is like this seems like a whole bunch of different like tribes here like there's nothing like one single country here it's a bunch of, like i said it's a bunch of like sm smaller provinces slash countries i guess whatever you want to call it and uh but like i like you know, the different colors and you kind of like you see who's on the same side so it's it makes it a lot easier when you know there's just like hey, there's this side and this side you know before i was kind of confused i thought there was a whole bunch of different kind of sides going on and that really had me confused i mean still i'm still i'm still confused guys but i'm kind of it's easier to piece it together now you know <laughs> i hope you guys know <laughs> oh god neutrality wallenstein initially held off from pursuing the protestant commander but after a while he set off with 20,000 men aiming to catch up with Mansfeld. It is possible that Wallenstein had waited deliberately until Mansfeld uh -oh. had gone too far to turn back. Yeah, he's too far out there, man. Where's your help? At the same time, Thiel had systematically captured and razed the strongholds at Munden, Nordheim and Göttingen, with massacre and plunder occurring throughout the entire campaign. Christian IV raced south in order to attempt a relief, but was too late. Realizing he was now being chased by the Catholic League army, he retreated to the north, attempting to get back to Wolfenbüttel, but was harried by the enemy forces all the way. He chose not to dump the baggage train to increase his army's speed, and because of this was forced to deploy on August 27th Here when Thiel caught up near Luther and Barenberger. Both armies numbered around 20,000 and formed up with the Humica stream between them, with the Danish using it as a defensive obstacle. The Danes had a few more cannons than Thiel, but made bad use of them. Only two of the 22 guns fired at one time, whereas the Catholic League guns were used much more effectively, wow. shooting bloody holes into the enemy ranks. Damn. After softening the Danish force up, Calvary. the League co-commander, Anholt, opened the battle by crossing the stream and advancing with his tertios under artillery cover, eventually managing to gain a foothold on the other side. At the same time, contingents of Imperial Kirasir, Harkabusia and Dragoon cavalry were dispatched around each wing and crashed wow. into the Danes in a double envelopment. Teal center now crossed the stream and managed to seize all the Danish artillery, as well as much of the baggage train. And well, apparently Teal knows what he's doing in battle right now. And who's the Danish guy's name? Uh, Christian. Let me see. Let me see here. Where's your, where's your name at, dude? Uh, it's not showing. Uh, but yeah, this seemed like God just walked down, wiped him out. Teal just knew what he was doing and how to play this landscape. And his equipment was actually working. And the Protestant dude just seemed like he, he was just set on, like, you know, I'm staying here. We're going to fight. We're going to do it. Like, there was no, it doesn't seem like there was a lot of strategy except for trying to hold on, hold the fort. Uh, so, anyways, let's continue. And managed to seize all the Danish artillery as well as much of the baggage train. To the southeast, Wallenstein confronted Mansfeld and Gabor on the frontier, but this imperial show of force was enough to make the Ottoman-supported Hungarians seek peace. Huh. Seeing there was no hope, Mansfeld tried to escape, really? but died of disease in the Balkans. Wow. <laughs> Back in Saxony, Thiel's force. I'm I'm sorry, but like, what are you doing all the way? I mean, I guess he thought he had some support over here. What are you doing all the way down here, dude? Like basically all your support is way over here like i don't know what what he i think he was gonna die anyway like even die from disease like where is he going because <laughs> it seems like he's cornered either way so I mean, damn died from disease man, that's rough it's rough <laughs> Back in Saxony, Thiel's forces now besieged Wolfenbüttel and Nienburg on the Weser. Having made his way back north after his triumph, 
Wallenstein joined Thiel just north of Lauenburg in September, and together the two overran Holstein and forced the Danes to retreat. As a reward for his service, Wallenstein was made Duke of Mecklenburg, an act which was controversial even to fellow Catholics. Huh. The new Duke wanted another base for his burgeoning fleet, and was convinced to cast his gaze onto the Hanseatic city of Stralsund, a town famous for defying ducal authority. In early May 1628, one of Wallenstein's subordinates, Hans Georg von Arnim, was commanded to put Stralsund under siege. This one's the perfect gift for the friend who's been getting a little too comfortable commercial. during quarantine. We're not Maybe your son, about a father, or in your the boyfriend. Comments. In which. Skip. <laughs> Initially, he did not wish to damage imperial prestige by using Whoa. such force, so he only loosely blockaded the city. Inside the walls, wealthier aristocrats generally favored compromise, whereas poorer citizens, led by just Kinnis von Gosen, would rather resist as they would likely suffer the most under any occupation by Wallenstein's mercenary army. As the first imperial assaults began, Stralsund had 20,000 inhabitants and was defended by a citizen force of 2,500, a levy of 1,500, and a further thousand mercenaries recruited the previous winter. Arnim now demanded the surrender of the city. In order to add more weight to imperial demands, he seized the island of Danholm, just off the eastern edge of the harbour, and this managed to put cannons in range of the city. Wow. However, Arnim had no fleet and could not resupply his force. The relatively small Stralsund navy managed to blockade the trapped Imperials on the island until it surrendered on the 15th of April, depriving their forces of a few cannons. Good job, dude. Over the next month, 6,000 reinforcements arrived at the Imperial siege lines, which prompted Arnim to command a night assault, but this was repelled relatively easily, and the attackers retreated. Seeing the initial success of the defenders, Christian IV, who had retreated into Denmark, sent 1,000 Scots and Germans to assist the town under the nice. command of Heinrich Hulk. So I'm kind of like rooting for the underdogs here because the Christians have been kicking butt right now, and the, and the Protestants, but kind of been like the ones losing on the losing side. So it's kind of like it could be sports or anything. I usually root for the underdog unless I'm like following so this is like a war thing like i'm following caesar you know he's the main focus and so i'm gonna kind of root for him and i want him to conquer and all that fun stuff but when it comes to these little battles here when i don't have a dog in the fight like to be you know i'm not biased at all like i'm not protestant or christian so you know i'm not i don't even look at like other way just kind of looking at the the two sides and uh kind of going with it <laughs> So I'm kind of root for the underdog, right now the Protestants are the underdog, so I'm kind of rooting for them in this situation. You're like, oh, repel them back, they have the smallest, fo the smaller force, like, you guys can do it. I'm just kind of like, this is what I'm thinking. Assist the town under the command of Heinrich Hulk. After a few more small-scale repulsed attacks on the 26th and 27th of May, Arnim resorted to repeated massive artillery bombardments as he waited for Wallenstein to arrive. 600 more reinforcements arrived on June 20th under the Swedish flag. Good deal. Three Swedish days later, flag. the town concluded a 20-year-long alliance with the King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, who then chose to garrison the town. This nice. was the beginning of Sweden's intervention in the Thirty Years' War. Because I was gonna say the Swedish, I thought like the Swedish and the Danish were kind of like a rivalry going on, but I guess you know they're putting that aside for now. I'm just, I'm just, just for now, it seems like because uh, you know to, to kind of help out here. So Sweden's entering the war now, hmm. and because uh, I read, I read, not read. I oh, guess yes, I did read, but you got a couple of you guys in the comments about you know. Something about the Swedish king. Try not to do spoilers in the comments, guys, please. <laughs> so, you know, this, this, this I read in the comments the Swedish king has a big role to play you know, in this. And, you know, try not to, try not to uh, elaborate 
you know, a lot on that kind of stuff because I, 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 I like to be surprised in these kind of videos. So just a heads up for future videos, guys. Okay. <laughs> All right, back to the war. I mean, you guys are probably sick of me pausing this. This was the beginning of Sweden's intervention in the Thirty Years' War. The siege intensified on June 27th when Albrecht von Wallenstein arrived in person. He took command of the Imperial forces from Arnim and renewed the assaults with a great intensity. In these attacks, the Scottish forces were defending the key eastern district of Franken under the command of Robert Munro. While they distinguished themselves and wow. managed to repulse the attackers, 500 of the 900 Scots were killed and a further 300 Damn. were wounded, including Munro himself. Wow. Scots are in this During the cool. following night, Wallenstein succeeded in taking the outer fortifications of the city, but could not progress any further. Instead, he again resorted to mass bombardments with his heavy guns. On the following morning, the Duke of Pomerania, Boguslav XIV, sent envoys to urge Stralsund to surrender, but they refused. On June 30th, more Swedish vessels arrived and reinforced the defenders with a further 600 soldiers, whilst under heavy fire from the Imperial cannons, which were now wary of any ships approaching. Good deal, good deal. The situation began to change on the 17th of July, when Alexander Leslie arrived with 1,100 more Scots. He almost immediately sallied out of the defences and launched an audacious attack on the siege lines, inflicting many nice. losses. The next week was decisive. Inclement weather, in the form of heavy rainfall between the 21st and 24th of July, turned the battlefield into a sea of mud, making the attacker's situation untenable. Finally, on the 4th of August, Wallenstein lifted the siege. For the first go. time in the Thirty Years' War, Albrecht von Wallenstein had been defeated. Nice. Well done. Christian IV wished to capitalize on the Protestant success at Stralsund and again began to raise an army on the island of Usedom. On the 11th of August, 1628, Christian marched to Volgast and captured it, meeting no resistance from the imperial garrison. The Danish king was then met with overwhelming support from the local population to turn Volgast into a fortress like Stralsund. He then awaited Wallenstein for the final battle. Here we go. The imperial commander had withdrawn from Stralsund after his defeat and headed east to face the new Danish force in the field with 7,000 troops, consisting of 33 infantry companies, 20 cuirassier companies, and 11 cannon. The Danish army had 6,000 soldiers, including 1,500 cavalry and 400 Scots from the Donald Mackay regiment. Wallenstein attacked on the 22nd of August, quickly wiping out the Danish right flank and killing 1,000 Danish troops, capturing yeah. another 600. Nightfall wow. allowed Christian and some of his troops to retreat on their ships. Volgast was badly burned and looted, and the Danish garrison had to surrender. Damn, that easy? This was the final stage of the Danish intervention on behalf of the Protestant cause, and it seemed as though the Catholic cause was once again ascendant. However, Stralsund showed that the tide was gradually turning. Two events in the next year, 1629, would affect how the war would progress. First, the Peace of Lübeck ended the conflict between Wallenstein and Christian IV, both of whom now needed peace. The agreement was remarkably lenient to the ostensibly humbled Danish king, who was allowed to retain his pre-war position on the condition that he would promise not to militarily intervene on the side of the Protestants again. Okay. Second was the Edict of Restitution, a decree which attempted to retroactively enforce the Clause of Augsburg that Catholic lands were no longer to be held by Protestants. This was a bold enough act to cause many moderate Lutherans, who had kept silent up until now, led by the Elector of Saxony, to become increasingly threatened. However, they were now on their own again, until a new force would appear to once again intensify the Thirty Years' War, the Kingdom of Sweden, led by Gustavus Adolphus. We'll talk about it in the next video on the Thirty Years' War, so make sure you are subscribed. Alright, well... 
I'm sorry, but that's so it wasn't really spoilers you guys giving me because they just kind of announced it right now because uh uh yeah he's obviously gonna be playing a big part because right now the christians have just been kicking butt the holy roman empire like they've been fighting off the protestant you know the you know the protestants the protestant armies and uh and it really it just seemed like it was going to end right there but obviously it's not but you know for the holy roman empire it seems like okay we won this but Apparently, Swedish has got, like, a pretty, you know, Sweden, the Sweden, uh, you know, the Swedish Empire, or the, I'm not sure, but apparently they got a pretty sizable force up there, and a pretty capable king, you know, a pretty good leader, apparently, and uh, it seems like they're about to do some business. Uh, no, that's what, obviously, that's what they're insinuating, and just from some comments I've seen, you know, uh, you know, some of you are excited, you know, about, you know, their king. Is it king or emperor? Let's see something here. I'm sorry, I, I'm just kind of, I just want to check something. The kingdom of Sweden, led by Gustavus Adolphus. Yes. We'll talk about it in the next video. Okay. The kingdom of Sweden. So, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, it looks like we got some, uh, it looks like we got looks like we got a heavy hitter for the Protestants about to head south here and make himself known, uh, apparently. So that's really interesting. Uh, I'm definitely a lot more into it this episode because I kind of feel like I know what's going on. I really don't. I really just don't understand. Like, I guess the, the different colors here and like what all this is. I, I guess because I just don't really understand. I guess that's just like. Provinces or as uh, Austria, I guess. Well, I'm sorry. This the different color confuses me, but obviously the the purple is the uh, Holy Roman Empire. Empire, and then you have. Uh... Anyways, got. I can pretty much get what's going on right now. I mean, there's still, as far as the land, is a little confusing, but that doesn't take away anything from me understanding kind of like what's going on. It just looks odd to me, I guess, but. Uh, definitely hit the like and subscribe, guys. I hope you're enjoying uh, the 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 see. I mean, it's only the second episode, but I hope you know you're enjoying this. I know I know some of you are actually watching along with me for the first time. I really appreciate it. And if you are, I definitely uh, you know subscribe to Kings and Generals too. You know because they're the, it's the content I'm watching, and I really you know and they. They give me the content to give to you guys, basically. So definitely support them as well. Uh, and yeah, definitely keep the comments coming. Like you guys, get yeah, all out last video. I mean, the comments and some of the discussions you guys had in there, amazing. I really appreciate the support. I really do. And thank you for not going in on me <laughs> for that video because I really felt bad about being lost. But we will continue on, guys, in the 30 years war. Definitely a totally different video and different kind of war than I've seen in past videos, which makes this very interesting. And I'm actually really getting into, you know, because it's because you, know, you got like different kings and emperors, and uh, yeah, it's not just one side, one side. I mean, these are like, you know, it's religion based, but they're also they all well, you know they all want more land, they all have more into it, but they're. They have ties through religion, you know, they're their friends, you know, they're allies through religion, you know, both sides. And you know, they need they need each other's help to kind of reach the end goal they want as far as you know, getting more land or whatever they want, you know. So uh yeah, um I'm really looking forward to it. What do we do? Oh yeah, next we have the Swedish king, Swedish kingdom. Is he a king or is he, uh, I'm not I think is he a king or I guess it is the kingdom, so I'm assuming he's king. Uh, I'm sure you guys can let me know in the comments if, if he's king or not. But uh, anyways, guys, once again, I'll, I'll repeat myself a million times. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and uh, I will catch you guys. Let me see. I want to see what the next one is called. Adolphus. I don't even really know how to pronounce that. I don't know what that is. Looks like we're going to 1631. So we're going to jump a couple years. And yeah, well, 
see where this series goes, guys. Uh, awesome stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've delayed enough, and I know you guys have probably clicked off this video by now, so I'm just going to end it right here. But lots of fun, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Have an awesome day. You guys are amazing. I love you, and I'm out of here. Peace, bye.